Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm so excited to see you all. And we're going to get started in just a moment. Just let people sort of come in in the next minute or so. Um, and again, protocols for Zoom, please make sure that you're muted. If you'd like to have uh, your video on, I'm sure that that would be wonderful for Vicki and Bonnie to see your faces. Um, but do remain muted throughout the entirety of it. And we do um, request that you open your chat box so that if you have questions, you can write them in there. We do have a Q&A at the end of this evening. So we'll just wait about 30 more seconds for folks to come in and then we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Hello, Nextful friends. Hi, everyone. Feel free to uh, put your location in the chat and how are you feeling today? I know this is probably the second or maybe the third week for some of the uh, K-12 folks and for college instructors, college professors, this may be your first week in person, online. How's the weather up there? The storm is hitting North Carolina really hard. We're gonna have a second Second snow day on Friday, probably. And I am in Maryland. We're supposed to get some really uh, tricky, messy, slee, ice, snow, some sort of tomorrow morning. Have fun with the snow, Vicky. No. <laughs> I, mean, I, want, I, I want good snow like I want like snow where like we can sled but not ice and we always get ice we always get sleep it's a struggle in these winter months isn't it <laughs> all right it looks like folks are settling in and we have a short amount of time this evening so let me get started uh, with the business side of things, and then I'll turn it over to Vicki and Bonnie. So on behalf of the Northeast Conference, I welcome you to our fall and winter virtual workshop series. This series has been generously sponsored by Wayside Publishing. Please visit waysidepublishing.com for more information about how Wayside can assist you with um, remote and in-person teaching and learning needs. My name is Becky Bray Rankin. I'm a member of the NECTFL board, and I'll be hosting this evening's workshop along with fellow director Cheyenne Hu as co-host. We're grateful to our presenters, Vicki Wang and Bonnie Wang, for offering us their time and expertise. Today's workshop is Antibias Practice in the Language Classroom, and it's being recorded. A link to the recording and also to the slides will be posted to our website as soon as it's available. The workshop is scheduled to last one hour, the first 45 minutes are devoted to the presentation, and the remaining time will serve as Q&A with the presenters to answer your question. Attendees are encouraged to submit questions during the workshop using the chat box, and we will monitor that and then ask those questions in groups at the end. In the event of any technical difficulties, please try to reconnect. If the problem is on our end, we'll email all the attendees with further instructions when available. So allow me to introduce you to our wonderful presenters. Bonnie Wang is a Chinese teacher and diversity, equity, and engagement curriculum consultant at Durham Academy Upper School, and that's in Durham, North Carolina. She was awarded the 2019 Teacher of the Year by Foreign Language Association of North Carolina, that's Flank, and is serving currently on the board of several teachers associations, including Skolt and Flank. Wang holds an MA in Linguistics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her pedagogical research focuses on proficiency-based language assessment, incorporating social justice into the world language curriculum, as well as integrating calligraphy, tai chi, and classical poetry into Chinese language and culture curriculum. Thank you so much, Bonnie, for being here. And then Vicki Wang is currently working at the St. Paul Schools in Maryland as the upper school Chinese language and culture teacher. She's also serving on the Asian Students Affinity Group as a mentor and the International Club Advisor. Ms. Wang was the VP of the Chinese Language Association of Secondary and Elementary Schools, better known as CLASS, for the year of 2021 and board, directors, board of directors since 2016. 
She's one of the founding members of Courageous Dialogues with Chinese Educators to create affinity spaces for Chinese educators to grow and to learn about how to advocate for themselves, as well as to create a safe and equitable learning environment for our students. Ms. Wang is currently serving on the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for ACTFL and was a member of the Leadership Initiative for Language Learning Cohort 3. So Vicki and Bonnie, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Welcome. And again, to folks who are just joining, we ask you to stay on mute. And if you'd like to participate in the chat, that would be welcome. Turning it over to you, Bonnie and Vicki. Thank you, Wayside. Thank you, Nectful. And thank you, Becky, for introducing us. Welcome, everybody, for our workshop tonight, Anti-Bias Practice in Language Classroom. Vicky and I will use our language classroom experiences from our Chinese language teaching Chinese language and culture classroom practices, but we are confident that everyone in this, uh, in the audience, you can integrate that and modify it to your language classrooms, no matter what you teach. I'm so glad to see we have some uh, Chinese teachers in the audience. I also see uh, Spanish and French teachers as well. If you are teaching a language that is uh, not a Chinese or Spanish or French, you can type it in a chat and let us uh, recognize you. So uh, again, thank you for introducing me and Vicky. Um, we both use she, her, and the female tab pronouns uh, as our preferred pronouns. If you'd like to show us your pronouns, please rename yourself and so we can see each other's um, identities as well. So tonight we're going to uh, introduce our personal tips and some strategies that we use are effective in our own teaching and to show you some of those anti-bias practices uh, from the three perspectives, identity, exploration, inclusion, and the last topic we're, we're gonna talk about is cultural appreciation versus appropriation. So although the anti-bias curriculum is an activist approach to the educational curricula, which attempts to challenge prejudices and stereotypes, a lot, of, a lot of practices are already being integrated in our world language classrooms as we recognize that, because we, we have been using a lot of um, cultures, communities, comparisons in our five C's world, world readiness standards in our daily teaching and assessments. So there is no, um, exception for any language teachers, world language teachers to actually already start to think about anti-bias or even effectively um, integrate the integrated those practices in their in their uh, in their teaching in their classrooms and their daily interactions with the students. Many of us, we are the only or one of the few uh, teacher of color, faculty of color in our own school some of us, we have established the, the affinity space as a safe space for our students of color. Some of us, we are, some of you are already the leaders, the teacher leaders in the past few years in terms of the diversity, equity, and inclus inclusivity work. So we also recognize that. Thank you for doing that for, for, for our students and for ourselves. So we pay respect to all these standards that are used in our curriculum and classroom practices every day, including the world readiness standards, necessary actual intercultural can-do statements, global competencies, and especially recent years, social justice standards published by the Learning for Justice organization. We especially want to mention this standards that highlights those four domains, identity, diversity, justice, and action, that guided our educators to intentionally integrate those into our teaching and to address, to teach, and to model DEI on a daily basis. Vicky will guide us through the first keyword that we're gonna uh, talk about tonight. So at the same time, feel free to jump into the chat and then let us know any comments that you are having or any uh, reactions to our talk. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, before I start anything, uh, a little self-disclosure. I've had, oh, I was diagnosed with COVID a few weeks ago, and uh, now I'm still experiencing some, some, um, some people um, have described as sort of a, a brain fog. 
So I, I sincerely apologize if at some moments I pause and need a little bit more time to find my words because I've been experiencing that uh, while I'm teaching or talking to colleagues. So, you know, um, I apologize. Um, I apologize in advance. Um, anyway, so um, I would like to say, I would like to uh, introduce our first keyword, which is identity exploration. So for me, teaching identity in a Mandarin Chinese classroom, um, in the first, uh, in a very funda uh, foundational novice level, when we are uh, teaching about nationality, because that's one of the first, um, the, one of the first uh, units that comes on, um, it talks about identity. Uh, Bonnie, is the slide uh, flipped? Because I'm still seeing the okay, thank you. So we talk about uh, for many many years. I, when I talk about uh, nationality, um, I, I I never it never occurred to me to add the word de um, uh, descent. Like you know, I never it never occurred to me to add ethnicity, and um, and I I guess being Asian American, I was so used to uh, being seen as Chinese first. And because that I was immigrant myself and I carry an accent, um, I never thought twice about people questioning uh, where I come from. But um, it is really when I started, when, you know, when my kids start to uh, grow up in the school system, I realized that um, they are over and over still being asked that same question by teachers and by um, you know, their peers about where you come from. So, you know, Asians are not the only ethnicity in this country that experience this. Anybody that don't fit that stereotype, right? That don't, uh, that seem as outsider, right? I think that this ethnicity, like being an other, being the other, uh, depending on where you are, uh, depending on what, um, you know, what kind of time you are in this, you know, in, in history, um, it changes. Um, and so for me, um, I, I look at my, I went back and really look at my curriculum. I, and I think that um, I, what I asked myself, what can I do uh, in the very novice and foundational level to try to break that stereotypes, to try to teach my students. I, mean, I teach upper school, I teach high school. Upper school is sort of a independent school language. I teach high school. My students come in level one, usually ninth graders. They come in really carry already have all these stereotypes that are hard to break, right? But I, I, but my experience over the past few years is that if I try to introduce these ideas early on in my Chinese level one class, it's so much easier. It's like, you know, like it's so much easier to do that uh, compared to if I try to introduce, uh, you know, in level three or level four, when I want to get into uh, people's background, people's, you know, even their, um, their immigration history, right? Because everybody, most people, you know, from my classroom at least, they came, their ancestor came from somewhere, right? So why not just do that and teach them the language in the target language? And they're also learning in their own uh, mother tongue as well. Some of the words that they never used to ask their parents, you know, about their history, their family history. So I try to do this and I also, I add in um, words such as first generation, you know, first generation Mexican American, I'm second generation uh, Chinese American. And I have uh, students, uh, white students whose ancestors from uh, Europe, and they go went back and they try to use that language to apply to themselves. So um, I think that's very empowering. That sort of put everybody in sort of a um, level, like, you know, the same um, level play, uh, playing field. Because, you know, one of the things that I almost feel like um, I a fear that my white students may feel is that they feel left out. Well, they don't have to feel left out. If they are willing to go and um, and we if we intentionally create assignments where they can go back and feel very you know feel comfortably and ask the, their parents and their grandparents about their family, you know that's it could be very um, empowering. And next slide, please. Thank you, Bonnie. 
And then, uh, so this uh, assignment, this unit that I created, it was inspired by Joshua Cabral's podcast, World Language Classroom, episode 10, Equity in the Gla Language Classroom with AC Campero. So um, she mentioned that in her classroom, they uh, happened to have a, um, I, I believe a, uh, a, a museum um, that was doing an exhibit about superheroes around the globe. Well, I didn't currently, I, I don't currently have that. And I didn't uh, when I was, uh, but when I heard that on the podcast, um, I thought to myself, well, why not uh, create a unit where uh, students go and try to research on other superheroes, superheroes that they it may not be familiar to their to you know the American culture, so they they did they went ahead and they um they find they found uh, many superheroes around the globe you know uh, came from all different backgrounds with different ethnicity uh you know uh, lots of female uh, superheroes and um you know I I they you know I I think through that experience through that research um my minority students especially. Uh, really appreciated that because you know when when people say superheroes, um, you know mo most of you know what we created uh, in the comic world and in Hollywood, right? The the uh, you know the ones that are, that pop in your mind are often most often white superheroes. So I think through this exercise, I think really is uplifting and empowering. And then uh, within the same unit, I also. Um, naturally introduce the first Chinese American superhero, Shang-Chi, and a uh, uh, little reading. So they saw the movie, they had the reading, and um, you know, it's, uh, I think that it's very empowering for my students to see and to learn that um, Asians, you know, can be superheroes too. And it's not just Asians from Asia, but this is Asian American. You know, this is identity. I, I hope that uh, Mar Marvels can create more and make more uh, movies. I often think, I really do think that pop culture, right? Pop culture really has the most impact on our students. Uh, we can do a lot, but you know, this is something that I hope that we continue to see. And then to create their own superheroes. So um, this is the project uh, that they really, really enjoy. So uh, some of these guiding questions are in Chinese and I, you know, very, very uh, basic questions such as name and way they can choose, they can uh, choose where their superheroes uh, come from and raised and uh, their families, what job and their superpower. And then when they create their own superpower and that's, it really is, it's so, so, um, um, it's so powerful to see, you know, what what kind of uh, superhero, like what kind of even the outer appearance, right? What they choose. Um, so if you uh, go to the next page, next slide, right? So I have students actually. As my, as some of my students chose to uh, create super villains instead of superheroes, but they're they're very empathetic to their super villains because most super villains also have a very sad, you know, kind of stories, a background story. But anyway, but you know, I have uh, marginalized students that chose to create a superhero from a different marginalized culture. So a lot of my students actually did not create superheroes uh, that are necessarily reflect of themselves. But they use something, they, they really research because they have to choose, they want to choose a superpower that's sort of um, relevant also to the culture uh, that it comes from. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting to see. And also one of my students, because that, and I'm going to explain later when we talk about um, uh, gender and sexuality um, identities um, and preferences, I, I teach the um, the uh, uh, gender gender non-binary ta uh, pronouns in the very beginning. So my student, one of my students, uh, was very very comfortably using that ta, uh, yeah, and that ta in her project, in their project, because she um, identifies her and they. So you know, giving them the the word uh, very very uh, early on, um, it's. It's it's breaking. It's almost like um, it's so much harder if they have to 
kind of come out and then break that themselves. If we as teachers opening that window, opening that door for them and to say, this is completely okay and you are safe. And not only that, only in this, uh, in American culture or in the society that we're talking about, we're also talking about in the, uh, in, in the target language they're learning, in the Chinese culture, we also have the same conversation. Then they feel less um, alone. And, um, and this slide actually I wanted to talk about um, for another reason too, is that uh, when I, dis when I uh, teach in Chinese, for those of you that don't know Chinese, the pronouns, ta, um, we pronounce actually pronunciation are all the same. She, her, uh, and even it are all the same, ta. Now the female ta actually came from uh, in the 1950s when there was a wave of, uh, in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, there was a wave of feminism where uh, the pronouns uh, for female at the time was actually a completely different pronoun. It wasn't ta. So the female uh, women at the time felt like they wanted to have uh, equality. They wanted to have the, um, the same pronunciation as the male ta. So this female ta almost was created because of feminism. And and that, when I told the students about that background story, that was, uh, that I think it was eye-opening because it gave them a different perspective and understanding that every language and culture evolves differently. So when we're talking about uh, cultural comparison, when we talk about uh, when we are, uh, you know, especially now, right? Like when we're looking on social media, when we have all these information, right? We're talking about, uh, not jump into conclusion. Uh, when we are examining other people's culture, we really need to, you know, because we it's easy for, for us to just jump into conclusion and be very critical using our own lens. We want to, I want to let my students know that, you know, a lot of times we have to, uh, there's a lot more, right? We need to learn, we need to be open and we need to learn. And we understand that every culture, every language, and it has its own history. And, um, and the ta that you see on the left-hand side, uh, now that even though typing, we cannot, like there's still not a word, uh, not a uh, character for us to choose from on the keyboard, but people have been using the X and then pair with the other side of the character to create that ta. Or sometimes people just use the TA um, English to refer to the gender non-binary. So, so this is uh, something that I introduced from the very, very beginning. And this is the first year actually I put it in a quiz, an assessment where the students have to know um, the, you know, and yeah. And I was uh, very happily and surprised to see that my students start to use it in their own project. So. Thank you, Vicky. I actually also learned about the gender neutral ta in very recent, like recent five years. Um, it was not a it was not existing in my vocab when I grew up, um, and I I'm also living in this my my own heterosexual circle, my own bubble. So I did not have a lot of access and resources when I grew up to these cultures. So I'm glad that I get to learn that along with my students. And it's uh, it's very easy to just transition from what Vicky just talked about uh, about the gender pronouns and the non-binary uh, aspects in the target culture in Chinese communities and, and culture uh, to our next keyword of today, inclusion. So when we are thinking about inclusion, when we are thinking about building, uh, fostering an inclusive classroom, a lot of times people are thinking about the term diversity and inclusion. So because of that, race is not the only thing. Skin color, hair color is not the only thing that we are we are addressing every day, right? So in addition to that, in addition to race and ethnicity, we also need to address other uh, intersectionalities in within all the levels within the, the term uh, diversity and inclusion, age, gender, religion, sexual orientation, uh, gender expression, disability, neuro, neurodiversity, uh, economic status and and other diverse backgrounds, and when we when we are able to show those intersectionality in the target cultures, um, 
pluriform cultures. Uh, for example, if you are teaching Spanish, that could be Spanish spoken regions and countries. If you teach uh, French, that could be Francophone cultures as well. If you teach any other languages, there are more than one monolithic culture that speaks and use or used to speak and use that target language. So try to search all kinds of variety of the uh, the authentic materials and show that to students. So that's one way to teach the language or just to address the problem or just to model how you being a world language teacher, how, you, how open you are to welcome all different uh, backgrounds and different diversities within uh, the cultures. So then students, they see, they see that teachers are addressing those problems beyond the race and ethnicity and they are pretty sensitive about everything we're showing them on the screen in the handouts, right? So here are some photos that I usually, uh, I often use when I teach the family unit at my novice level. So even we can do that with, with our novice level students in the world language classrooms. Um, when, when we talk about family, some, sometimes teacher want the students to bring in their own picture, um, but some students may not want to share at the novice level, that's probably their first year learning a foreign language with, their, uh, with the peers and with you. And they don't feel comfortable and safe enough to tell you what is happening in their personal life. So the picture on the right side is actually uh, from one of our uh, good friends, Matt Koss. And I think he uh, adopted it from Spanish teachers um, there's no way that we, we could find the first person, the first teacher who, who used this, we can give the credits to. If you know who is the first teacher that created this chart, please type them in the chat and then let's um, all say thank you. I, we owe a big thank you to that teacher who first created this chart to show different, um, pe different persons within their family communities. And the, the picture on the left side, one is a um, cast photo of modern family. They have different family structures that we can show students and ask them to describe. Uh, not We're not talking about your family. You don't need to tell us who, uh, how many family members you have. You don't need to tell us whether you have one parent or two parents at home. You don't need to tell us how many siblings you have. Let's talk about them. Describe how many family members do you see in their family photos, family photo frames? And also look, look at this uh, Asian American photos. We, we are also finding this intersectionality as well. And they, they, they have um, a grandma living along with the, the big family. So we can also talk about the family structure that has three, genera three generations in one household. How good is that? And I think Vicky wants to show this quote to us tonight, right, Vicky? Right. So this quote uh, avoids stereotypes and uh, exotification through only food, festival, and fun. And this is from Noreen Nazim uh, Rodriguez. Um, I when I saw that, I was in my like I I was just like thinking to myself, yes. I mean, and no, because that's exactly what I did for the, at least like the first few years when I was teaching and when I was building my program, because that's what my school wanted me to do. That's how I built my program. And that's what my students wanted to see. Um, but you know what, like, you know, I, I think that when I first started my career, I felt that I was been almost like educated and told that this is what we want. You show us this. but. Uh, and I was, you know, a, a, uh, a greener, you know, teacher. And I was, I, I went along, I was thinking, okay, yeah. And I spent so much time, you know, making dumplings for everybody, you know, teaching everybody dumpling, making dumplings fun, they're delicious, but there's gotta be more that we can do in our classroom. That's not the only thing that should, that, that should be important or valued in our school and our programs. So, um, I took a little bit of a of, of different approach after actually many, many years of doing sort of the same thing, right? I from the again in a foundational, very novice level, I make sure that my student know we may be eating dumplings, but Wang Lao Shi has never actually ate dumplings for Lunar New Year. Like that's not my thing. We are Southerners. 
like my 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 um, parents, like they grew up, like we grew up in Taiwan. We usually have many many dishes. We have fish. We have seafood. We don't have dumplings. So they're often surprised. You guys, you don't all eat dumplings? No, not everybody eats dumpling. Just like you know, we we would not like you know ask. I, I asked around. Do you guys all eat the same thing for Christmas, for New Year's, for you know? Not, not even everybody eat turkeys on Thanksgiving, right? So how would you uh, assume that everybody eat dumplings in China? So, you know, really showing that, uh, right? Showing that diversity in the very novice level, I think has a great impact. Yes, and especially at the novice level, that's at the level when we are easily making very general statements about the cultural practices or even cultural products uh, that could lead a very biased cultural perspectives to our students. We might say something that is very problematic before, but now let's try to address it. Let's try to correct it. Americans eat burgers, Chinese eat dumplings. That's a very problematic sentence, but some, some of us, we might think, well, my students can't really say very complicated sentence to address the, com the complication of the world. Well, they can, right? They can say some American eat burgers. They can say many American eat burgers. They can say many, American, many Americans like burgers and I am as well, or but I, I'm not like them. They can use short sentences to establish the argumentation easily, at, even at a novice level. American wear jeans, Chinese wear Chinese dress. Not really, I wear jeans and I see some people are wearing all different types of clothes. Um, so the more students are involved in this process, the more they will, they will agree that we shouldn't say like all, or we shouldn't just use the, the general term to address what is happening in, in their world or what is happening in the whole world. So um, another example will be when our students first learn the nationality words, they, they may not say Chinese drink hot tea, American drink hot iced tea, because as I said before, so much of the Chinese culture that our students are exposed to, they're Mandarin speaking Han Chinese culture, which happens to be my culture, right? Because the Han people, we, uh, we, we made 95% of the Chinese population that's over a billion. And our students, they have higher chance to meet a person that shares a similar background with, with, with their Chinese teacher who's talking to them every day. So by saying that, by saying Mandarin speaking Han Chinese culture is the Chinese culture, we are ignoring the fact that Chinese culture is massively diverse with 55 other ethnicities besides Han people. When I showed my students how Mongolian Chinese people, they celebrate the Lunar New Year, they also don't eat dumplings, they eat a lot of steamed buns and a lot of milk products. Uh, when I also showed my students the Tibetan people, when they are making dumplings, they're not using the traditional flour, uh, the wheat flour, they're using a high mountain Tibetan wheat flour. And inside of their dumplings is not, is not pork, is um, a high mountain Tibetan cow meat or Tibetan uh, animal meat. And sometimes we also see many vegetarians in the Chinese culture. Many of them, they are vegetarian because they are Buddhist. That's due to their religious belief. And that is also another aspect that we are showing students. Religion is a different uh, intersectionality that's showing students the, the, the part of the truth or part of the, the world in the, in the target culture. So let's come back to, this is the continental America, right? Right, so, um, so, so one of the ways uh, approach that I take um, to teaching, really embracing this um, uh, diversity is come back to where they are, where um, sort of they're used to and they're comfortable with and learning about um, their food. Like, you know, when we're talking about food, right? Like their food, or what, what are the food origins? Um, and they actually learned uh, many things that um, they're used to came from different cultures. 
Um, so using sort of a medium, um, a unit such as food, which all, you know, all my levels, they learn, you know, at one point in a year and kind of expanding and then really using that to reflect on um, sort of like, you know, food, the evolve, the, the new identities, the generations, the change, is sort of like human development, right? So there are things that, um, uh, that they have, um, you know, they research, they have learned, they, and they, they're surprised that they did not know that uh, there are a lot of different things that did not come from uh, the U.S. Actually, most things that they have <laughs> that they have uh, research on did not come from um, the U.S. But there are things that came from the U.S. that they did not know. For example, fortune cookies, right? And that's a simple fact. Most people that thought that fortune cookie, I mean, it's a Chinese. It's not a Chinese um, from China's thing, at least. So you know, fortune cookie, right? So fortune cookie here, right? So, the, so for me to expose the students to understanding and also um, it is completely okay. I never, so this is another mistake that in the beginning of my career that I have made and which is some sort of taught when I was growing up that when I look at uh, Panda Express and they say, that's not Chinese, almost say it with a kind of a disdain because my parents did that, that's not Chinese. Well, it's Chinese American. Uh, I don't know. I mean, is it Chinese? Is it American? I mean, Chinese American, it is a culture. It has its own very unique culture. And they have unique, we have very unique cuisines. And my kids uh, tend to like Chinese American foods more than the Chinese quote unquote authentic, I hate that word, authentic foods, right? So you know, having my students differentiate, and I have actually a picture of sushi there because I also have show my students a, a, a video about how Japanese people in Japan uh, tasted the sushi, the American sushi, and they're like, what is this? I have no idea what that is. So, you know, they them understanding what they're used to calling the Japanese, even Chinese food, right? What do Chinese and Japanese people overseas really see these foods, you know? And how would a Chinese American, Japanese American, for example, feel about their identity here? Because, you know, me being a Chinese American, a one and a half generation Chinese American, I feel sometimes in between and stuck. I don't know where I belong because people, neither group saw, see me as authentic enough, sort of like the American sushi or the Kung Pao chicken. Uh, and fortune cookies. So, you know, these things, using these medium to have to make my students understand that these, um, you know, to build that empathy really is uh, what I, you know, hope to do. And uh, just a little story about Russian, I said Russian borscht to Chinese luosong tang. And, and the Chinese luosong tang is a tomato based soup. Really, the origin was from Russian. Uh, from uh, Ukraine, actually the uh, Ukraine, uh, from Ukraine, why I was told, but Russian borscht, uh, the Russians went to Shanghai, uh, immigrated to Shanghai and uh, wanted to recreate, but did not have beets. So they used tomato instead. And it was, it was called the Russian soup in Chinese. But a lot of people did not know this origin, even Chinese people who I grew up eating the soup did not know. And then uh, next slide is um, again, like, you know, I like to talk about food. Uh, I am um, unapologetically, I am a, one of the virtual class. I even ate one of the black eggs that you see on the screen. And that is a, uh, they're called a thousand year old egg. I know the name kind of uh, <laughs> is scary, but uh, really it's just preserved. It's preserved eggs. And, um, you know, I, when I was growing up, I felt that lunchroom uh, cafeteria was a scary place. And I had to struggle with what to bring to school. And this is the kind of things that, you know, at least at my school, we had this conversation. How do we, um, at, you know, teach students to be respectful around, uh, you know, people's, you know, traditions and culture, right? And lunch is something it's so 
personal. And I mean, I, there is, there's, this is something that we just, we don't just teach in our language classroom. It should be taught and in, in, incorporated in a lot of different uh, disciplines so that the students naturally appreciate and respect, at the very least, respect, right? Uh, people's traditions. And, you know, I, I mean, well, I think that's right. It, it, it should open up, right, for uh, students to even want to try. I mean, you know, students who maybe want to, not during COVID time, we don't share food, right? But after COVID, right, I hope that people are willing to try each other's foods. And, and no uh, students um, from any culture feel like they cannot, they don't, they want to hide their food, they don't want to, or they toss their, their mom's food because, not because they don't like it, because they don't want their friends to see it. And then this is a little uh, project that I did, um, again, to, uh, uh, again, going back to embracing their own culture, embracing their own background, a food log about uh, their own family dish. So uh, my students, this is uh, something that I did during the virtual time where they had to work with a family member. It could be a sibling, it could be mom, dad, or even grandparents um, to, uh, they have to, they have to, actually research on the origin of each ingredients. So uh, one of my students uh, who's Italian American uh, actually found out that the pasta is from China, surprisingly. So she was like, oh, this is very interesting. And she felt even more connected to, you know, Chinese. So, you know, these little things like that make them realize, uh, you know, what the, you know, again, ingredients, right? Each ingredient, where they come from, there's a reason why, right? And then uh, the opening of, for example, Silk Road, they learn about Silk Road, okay? And how things were traded, at what time did these dishes come together because of opening of um, communication and travel and also uh, through trades. So these are the, the things that even though I might not be able to uh, you know, in their proficiency level to expose them in my class necessarily, but through their research, they find out themselves and they come back and they, they present it to the class. I see some really good comments in the chat, including uh, Lourdes Flores saying, different approaches is great and food and festivals however, are always linked to cultures, which is a really good point. So if we can go with the food unit, we can teach the food unit very well, the food theme really well, it can connect to all um, actual sub-levels in your program. Uh, after four years of study with us in the world language programs, students are not going to solve the world hunger problem. If they can at least not yuck at other people's food and show respect when they see some people are eating anything that they never tried before. That's a that's achievement. That's something that they can they can do to promote the justice, right? Uh, one project that I want to share with you guys that I shared uh, with the Mafla event last night is the New Year dinner family picture project that I did with my students. So students they can do they can draw or they can use. Photoshop, they can use Bitmoji, it doesn't have to be real people's photo to show their new year dinner picture. And the new year is very wide, broad term. Some people celebrate Lunar New Year. Some people celebrate Rosh Hashanah, Diwali. Some people celebrate the New Year's Day. Any new year can be a new year. So they are going to show who are their family members sitting at the table to eat the dinner and what, what are they eating for their specific New Year's celebration. By doing that, we are recognizing and appreciating different, uh, fa different students, family background, their uh, traditions, um, even sometimes their cultural or religious beliefs, uh, sometimes are their food preferences. And also we can learn about each other's interesting facts about themselves. So this project, you can try that with your novice level, your novice high, intermediate, low, mid, even at intermediate high level. And you can create an interpretive, interpersonal and presentational integrated performance assessment as well. 
So I think the last topic we're going to uh, do very briefly for five minutes is about cultural appreciation versus appropriation. Uh, I'm going to show you two pictures of very auspicious items in my culture. On the left side is some golden paper, golden gold color paper. On the right side, uh, there are uh, gold ingots. If you know two of them, they are both indi individually, they are very auspicious and uh, lucky and people like them uh, in the culture that I come from. But when you combine them together, it looks like this. It looks like a, a folded gold fortune ingot or fortune nuggets. And this the opposite of auspicious. This is called Joss ingot. People burn them for the Chinese funerals, for the traditional, uh, sometimes East Asian, sometimes Southeast Asian uh, cultures that influenced by the Chinese culture. People will burn them along with other Joss paper, Joss money, um, and they have to pick a day. Usually it's the, the funeral day, sometimes the, the Chinese tomb sweeping day, sometimes the Chinese ghost day. Uh, sometimes it's another uh, day that means a lot to the deceased family member. Sometimes people will also burn them along with the incense sticks or jaw sticks, but these are not gonna be auspicious or lucky items or, um, I know they look like origami, right? Some people may think, well, they look like paper folded stuff and looks cute and they're not. I found two other examples that some of you may be familiar with. If you, um, if you do Twitter or if you have been paying attention to news recently. So these are the cultural appropriation. And sometimes they are from ignorance. Sometimes they spread out very quickly because People who are into this culture, they see a cultural products, but they do not really know what is behind the what is behind the meaning. What, what is uh, what are the the intention behind the existence of those cultural products? They may connect connect it in a wrong way, mistakenly with a different cultural perspectives. Uh, Bonnie, you want to explain what's going on, on the right hand side? <laughs> Yeah, so I've seen those on Amazon and I was like, I remember we used to own one of those when I was very young. I lived with my grandparents, I grew up with them. Um, and these are not for fruit or wine or anything display. So these are not appropriate to put on the table. No, no. Um, nowadays, many families, they do not own them anymore because um, many places they have better hygiene systems. They have better uh, indoor restrooms that they can use instead of using a pot. Well, it's, it's like the bedpan that you use uh, in the hospital. So, it, you know, people used to do that, you know, especially uh, in places that were cold and, you know, they, they keep a bedpan, you know, by their bedside, or, you know, they didn't have to walk outside for uh, a bathroom. But, you know, you, as you can see that it's been appropriate to be a, a wine uh, cooling, you know. <laughs> so these are the things that actually when we see it, right, it's, it, the point is that if you're not from that culture, it's so easy to mistake it as something else. So I don't see them in the school, right? If you so are a you know, learner of Chinese class, I don't teach those in my Chinese classroom because from my culture, we don't have them. We don't have those items. Those cultural products are uh, very intentionally staying beset away from the school subjects. So for a lot of people who have taken Chinese, some people they've learned Chinese many, many years. Some people they used to major in Chinese, but they never get to learn those items. So when they, when they see those items, they were like, well, they look similar to something else and eventually they will be unacknowledged, adopted in, in, a, in a proper way. So in that case, whenever you are not sure, just ask. Just yeah. ask, that's the best answer and I'm, to avoid all of that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, I, what I've learned is that I have made actually plenty of mistakes myself too. 
um, that later I found very re regret, deep regret. Um, the thing is that, you know, I, even with my own culture, I came here when I was 13 years old. There are a lot of things that I actually have to learn and relearn. And um, I, I, I think that, you know, like the picture before, right, was from the Guardian. The Guardian took a, a bunch of very, very beauty and beautiful, fancy Lunar New Year pictures um, with dumplings and the Joss paper, which is the burning uh, money paper to the deceased. I mean, even guardians made that mistakes in when, while they were taking the, these um, these uh, photos. So, you know, I think we need to give ourselves a little grace, but at the same time, there are a lot that we can do as educators now that we know it's how easy that we can make these mistakes, right? We can, um, you know, try to do more homework before we show something. And especially if we're not teaching the culture that we come from, uh, it's very easy to make these mistakes. And it's, it's, it doesn't hurt to ask your colleague uh, to email somebody that you trust, okay, to do more uh, Google searches and to see what the internet says. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have, have experienced, have seen, have witnessed other cultural appropriation. So if you want to share that with us, um, please type them in the chat and then we can all learn from each other. We also um, concluded some tips that we use in our classrooms to, um, to implement anti-bias approaches, including having a lot of uh, representations in your class materials and intentionally use more diverse and inclusive language. And also when we are uh, asking questions uh, try to think about how you, your students will react to your question. Are they going to only give you a one-sided view, or are you giving are you giving them the option of providing different aspects to the classroom? And I want to just add one more point: is that when we were always talking about stereotypes, and um, well, sort of assuming that all stereotypes are bad stereotypes. But in fact, um, even positive, quote unquote, positive stereotypes can create harmful effects too. Uh, for example, I have seen uh, one of the positive, st positive stereotypes is that, you know, Asians are smart, Asians, um, you know, are, um, have support, have resources, da, 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 da. That actually leads to um, what I've seen in my own school or in other school system is that using lack of uh, support and resources provided to those students. Uh, when they need it. So we, as educators, we have to be mindful that even positive stereotypes, you think that uh, this is, you know, you're, you're complimenting uh, this culture or this you know, group of people can cause uh, harmful um, effects and impacts. Thanks for addressing that because we all have our biases. And when Vicky and I, we were making this slideshow, when we were searching some of those creative templates on SliceGo, and I'm sorry, SliceGo company, when, we, when I was looking at a China category, so I, I just found, uh, I was trying to find some slides under the category China. Um, there is a bowl of fortune cookies that we just said is not really authentic Chinese, but somehow it's becoming a figure of Chinese American fusion, uh, new culture, right? So some of my Asian American students, they use fortune cookie to metaphor, <laughs> to, to metaphorize themselves. They, they told me that we are fortune cookies. We are the, the fortune one. Um, so I think we are going directly to the end. Do we have time for this little video, Vicky? I, I think so. No, okay. Becky, no, no, we don't have time. No, <laughs> Becky says no. All right, no worries. We'll send you the link so you can watch that short video. The video is uh, describing similar sentiments that we just shared with you. Thank you. We'll be sure to look for that because the slides will be posted on the next full site. But I did want to leave a couple of minutes for questions um, and we're wrapping up in five. So uh, I already see one question in the chat that we can start with. And then other folks, if you have additional questions, you can write them in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so we have one question so far about appropriation. So how can we avoid it? And then how do we address those who are appropriating? 
So, um, so I think uh, for me, since I'm teaching Mandarin Chinese, uh, some of the mistakes I have uh, made uh, was sort of oversimplifying, uh, stereotyping my own culture. And for example, in the uh, Lunar New Year, I have students that just uh, sort of wear uh, Chinese, you know, they're really not, I would say authentic, but Chinese looking dresses and just parade around the school and not really learning about the meanings behind, like, you know, even what uh, time periods they're from, right? Because when we're talking about Chinese looking clothing, right? They're from different dynasty, they're from different time periods. That could be a moment, a teachable moment, right? That could be an educational moment where I should bring in more education instead of just throwing these on them because they look good. Um, so these things that I, I admittedly have done, and I think that um, in the, I mean, I have changed my way of doing ever since that everything that I feel like I want to do, I want to make sure that there's educational value to it, that they're learning from it. They're not just, you know, posting and then for me to take picture and show to parents. I mean, that's really uh, very surfacey, not, you know, it doesn't have substance to me. And Bonnie, do you have any tips to? Yeah, so I, think I, I, mm -hmm, I typed my uh, tip in the chat. If you're not sure, check with native speakers. Uh, check with more than two native speakers because sometimes it could appear differently in different um, target cultures and communities. Even though this item is used in this way in a Chinese culture, uh, in, in my culture, that is in Northeast, uh, Chinese Han Chinese family, it could be used differently than uh, in Vicky's household, right? Maybe Vicky, she has different experience have with the the same cultural products. So check with people, share your plan with others. If you think, oh, I'm being very creative, I think I find something new that I can share with my students. Share with your colleagues first and see how they are reacting to it. Um, that's one way to avoid appropriation. That's very, that's a very good question. Since you're asking that, you would like to learn. I appreciate your courage. Another I, question. I, I, Go ahead. I would like to address one of the question. Uh, I think this is Lena's question about: uh, Would you recommend approaching these topics differently for homo, ho, uh, homogeneous white classroom versus more diverse classroom? Yes. I for me, I've uh, I think that we need to know our audiences. We need to know who we're teaching because baselines could be different. But at the same time, you know, uh, you know, again, I, I but then again, um, I cannot, there are so much that we don't know about people. We can't know just by looking at people. Uh, in the beginning of uh, my, again, teaching career, I assume that 99% of my students sitting down there are all white. And then my third year, when I started to uh, be a lot more self-conscious about my teaching, one of my students told me, and in classroom, finally felt comfortable telling me that she's a quarter Korean. And they actually, in her family, practice Korean tradition quite heavily. And I, oftentimes I think about this, and then I thought to myself, how, why did it take her two years or three years to feel comfortable about telling us about this in my classroom. Uh, could I have done something differently in the first year so that she felt more comfortable and safe to share this part of herself? So I, it's yes or no. I, I, you know, if you teach in a school, you know your audience, you know where the baselines are, but still don't assume that they are all this. Because, you know, I've, I, I think that, you know, students just, they need to be exposed to different culture. They need to feel safe. And then you will very surprisingly find and learn more about them. And I think you're, you're hitting the point, Vicky, by saying a uh, homogeneous classroom, we are looking at what perspective, right? If you're looking at the skin color, maybe they are homogeneous because they appear to be a white student, but 
they are all of them are different. It can't be homogeneous classroom with everybody sharing the same skin color. Uh, that's on, that's just only one of the multifaceted identities of each student. Skin color is just only one of them. Beyond that, what about their neurodiversity? What about their um, their family background? What about their um, family structure, learning uh, abilities, learning differences, their gender identity, their sexuality, a, a lot of them are beyond their skin color. If you do have a classroom with every, with most of your, your students, they appear to have a similar background, um, which is likely not going to happen because they will have all different backgrounds. But if there is, let's say if there is this uh, unicorn classroom that with most of the, the students, they share very, very similar backgrounds, you should still teach those topics. You should still approach them because you're modeling for them. As an adult, we are showing them what to do. We are showing them we care about their world. They are exposed to a very new world than our generation. They care about the social justice topics. They are uh, experiencing social media changes all the time. When I grew up, I wasn't so aware like the current generation. So we are modeling it. And even though you don't have a black student in your class, it doesn't mean that you can't teach African-American history or address the, address the BLM issues. Even though you don't have a queer student in your classroom, and I mean yet, or you just don't have it for this semester for this particular class, it doesn't mean you shouldn't address the issue that queer population are facing in America. Thank you so much, Bonnie and Vicky, for the answers to those questions. And I think that that's a great place to end, that just because you don't see it represented in front of you doesn't mean that we can gloss over it, but all these things are really important to our curriculum. So a big thank you to Vicky and to Bonnie for your very informative presentation and for Chaoyun for helping me moderate this evening. I'm sure everyone took away something. There are a lot of great uh, points to think about. As I mentioned in the beginning of the workshop, this has been recorded and the recording and the slides, which will include a link to the video, will be made available on the website shortly. And that's the NECFL website. For New York State teachers, if you need proof of attendance for CTLE credit, go to nectful.org slash virtuals. Teachers in other states can also go there, but you'll have to consult your local district about the regulations for documentation of PD hours. And very importantly, if you haven't yet, please register to attend our in-person 2022 NECFO conference in New York City. The theme is Classroom Roots Global Reach, and it's sure to generate interesting discussions. The preliminary program and registration information are available at nectful.org slash conference. I hope to see you all there. On behalf of the Northeast Conference Board of Directors, thank you for attending this workshop. Vicki, Bonnie, thank you so much for your insight and perspective this evening, and we hope that you all enjoy the rest of your nights. Thank you.